When it comes to the particular ancient Uparts that we share, which have a simply impossible age, this, in regard to the modern chronological paradigm of man's historical origins, in which man evolved from the sea to the cave and then into modern civilization, in a supposedly already mapped out and fully understood linear fashion with no gaps whatsoever. A position made to attain undeserved authority over historical teachings. Thus, when an object turns up which contests these so-called already established factual ideologies, it is either simply dismissed or those who oppose such possibilities of its existence go to great length to discredit its authenticity in any way. Furthermore, it must be mentioned that many more than could be contributed to coincidence have mysteriously disappeared over the years, scenarios, and events, which simply strengthen the original claims of the object's authenticity. Our next artifact of interest being no exception. Known as the Meister print, it is an artifact that many have attempted to discredit as an authentic human footprint for good reason. And when one recites the academic opposed theory regarding the dismissal of said hypothesis of human origin, it exposes how miserably said attempt was. It is simply written off as a portion of Jurassic strata, at which at some point in the distant past naturally fractured, coincidentally, into the form of a human-shaped shoe print. However, this explanation, or attempted dismissal, avoids any attempt to explain away the main feature within the print, which not only proves it was indeed a print, once made by induced pressure onto this ancient earth, but why it's claimed as an upart in the first place. Within the print, there exists a crushed trilobite, which proves this was indeed a pressed print, but also confirms an age of hundreds of millions of years. Thus, whatever made this print had a human-shaped foot, was seemingly wearing shoes or boots, and was heavy enough to crush an ancient arthropod. These facts, along with academia's miserable attempt to dismiss said upart, we therefore find highly compelling. Thanks to improvements in modern archaeological technologies, and indeed the evolution of satellite resolution imagery of our spinning living blue marble, we are fortunately entering an era where thanks to penetrative strata photography, the last remaining legacies of what we have long claimed would be found, that of once highly capable global lost civilization or possibly many. And yet another proof of this hypothesis has recently been rediscovered in Iran. A gigantic artificial wall, measuring approximately 71 miles in length, extending from the mountains of Bamu to an area near the town of Jamarg, Iran, has been exposed. To put this ancient feat into perspective, computer systems have estimated that more than 1 million cubic meters of stone would have had to have been quarried, transported, and placed where they now lay, and this is a mere remnant of its past grandeur. Quote, With an estimated volume of 1 million cubic meters of stone, its construction would have required abundant resources, this in terms of labor, materials, and tremendous toil and time, wrote Sajad Alibagi, PhD of the Archaeological Department of the University of Tehran, in an article published in the journal Antiquity. Although the existence of the wall, long claimed as unknown to mainstream archaeology, those who have lived nearby for millennia have known about its existence all along, knowing it as Gari Wall or Gari Chen Wall. The Venture Party state that due to the wall's poor state of conservation, the researchers are not sure who built the structure and for what purpose. In fact, they are not even sure of its exact width and height. The best estimate is about 4 meters wide and 3 meters high. Its exact purpose remains a complete mystery, one which we find highly compelling. To truly understand the astonishingly true history of the unfinished obelisk, one must first wade through a quagmire of well-financed fallacy, 
infested with many a false prophet, incomplete or simply illogical conjecture, all of which defended by countless academic figures of institutions of influence and power, acquired via the funding in their defense of a form of mass worship of academics' perception, as if an all-knowing authority. So, with things like the obelisk, for example, one begins to wonder if this all be by design. Since academic records of this monument began, no one who has described it, predictably, has ever managed to wrap their head around how such a stone could have possibly ever been moved. Ergo, all well-funded explorers, reporters, and journalists alike, with the expectant pressure of their return with a deciphered mystery. It would appear this explanation never arose, yet was skillfully averted. Firstly, the rock had indeed been abandoned abruptly at some point in history conveniently allowing academia to make nearly all those interested in the obelisk overlook this eventual intention by its original creators, a distraction made by a fault line. Chris Dunn, an independent investigator held in varied regard, found that details of decoration were already being added to the stone as it was being hewn, running exactly through this so-called fault disproving this so-long-held academic fallacy. Yet, alas, although the unfinished obelisk lay still attached to the strata of Earth, like that of the larger of the two megaliths in Yangsham Quarry, the largest some 16,000 tons, academia is not required nor would even attempt to provide any logical explanation as to how these blocks would have been moved. Additionally, however, and perhaps most revealing, is the pregnant lady of Lebanon, a 1,000-plus ton megalith, so large that just like that of the unfinished obelisk, no attempt was ever made to explain the ancient civilization responsible could have moved such stones to their final placements. Yet, remarkably, the proverbial nail in the coffin and vindication of our claim was the excavations made around the pregnant woman recently revealing that this stone was not abandoned on a slight incline, as claimed, but was placed atop another stone of even bigger proportions, suggesting it was part of a once enormous structure and exposing this reoccurring academic strategy when it comes to dismissing the controversial. It is a reality which we find incredibly annoying. Did the Great Sphinx once witness the bottom of a sea? There is evidence. Things we have covered on this channel in the past which would suggest just that. Who built these astounding structures found dotted all over the earth? When were they built? Were they really, like academia would like you to believe, built by primitive civilizations with the use of primitive tools, often made of copper and notoriously soft metal? Or is there a possibility that these structures were made by a far more ancient, far more capable, world-traversing civilization? Built in areas of geological interest, most often the center of a landmass or placed upon key lines? Although there is a large number of artifacts and archaeological factors which strongly suggest this exact scenario of events, we feel there is one collection of artifacts or rather evidence of this people's past existence, which, just like their clear originally intended function, could tie these monuments neatly together. Known as the missing ancient metal clamps, given their predicted age and metallic composition, the fact that they are no more should come as no surprise. However, the carved seats that these clamps once sat within are still present in the stonework of many ancient structures found all over the world. Within our own modern-day society, a society that can travel the world in a day and speak to the other side in an instant, technological advances are often copied or shared between nations. The concepts being the same, yet the manufacture slightly differing in form and the metal clamps display this exact phenomena. Slight variations in manufacture that can be seen dependent on the landmass the ruin is found upon 
Yet the concept behind the construction of these amazing and perplexing structures, often constructed using blocks we have no explanation as to the placement of, remain the same worldwide. Dry stone walling often accompanied by these clamps made with such skill, the blocks are now often perceived to have been made to measure. The builders were clearly very aware of shifting, which can be seen, as blocks settled over the following years. This offers a presumption that these structures were intended to last many centuries, if not millennia, and the metal clips were also designed to indeed rust away to nothing after their function was served. Amazingly, it seems that out of the countless thousands used, a few of the clamps have somehow managed to survive. The clamps from pre-Columbian South America that have been examined show them to be made of a very unusual alloy. 2% arsenic, 95% copper, with traces of iron, silicon, and nickel. This composition is particularly interesting within Puma Punca because there is no source nickel anywhere in Bolivia. The clips are clearly a compelling link between these ancient structures found all over the world, but more importantly, the builders of them. These amazing artifacts clearly deserve much more attention. Thanks for watching, guys, and until next time, take care. Due to the abundance of unexplainable ancient high technology and the advanced architectural abilities which we share found all over the world, in addition to the missing knowledge as to how these feats were once achieved, one must conclude that not only did the human species once experience a global catastrophe, but were also, seemingly, in global contact prior to said event. If this be the case, and the evidence we continue to present does indeed support such hypothesis, one would presume that we would see gaps in geological data, along with the forager paradox we recently shared in our Was Darwin Wrong special, which is the gap in population growth which one would expect to observe in the data to be present if our hypothesis be true. Intriguingly, it would seem that this gap has now also been discovered in the history of the human genome, and instead of being coined a paradox, they have instead been labeled a ghost population. According to the British media outlet The Guardian, quote, scientists have found evidence for a mysterious ghost population of ancient humans who lived about a half a million years ago and whose genes live on in people today. Traces of the unknown ancestor emerged 
When researchers analyze genomes from West African populations, up to a fifth of their DNA appeared to have come from the missing relatives. Geneticists suspect ancestors of interbred with the yet-to-be-discovered archaic humans tens of thousands of years ago, much as ancient Europeans once mated with Neanderthals." End quote. In other words, there are gaps in our genetic development, which supports the past experience of catastrophe and explains the loss of ancient knowledge. It continues, quote, In the people we looked at, they all had ancestry from this unknown archaic population, said Sharam Sankara Raman, a computational biologist who led the research at the University of California in Los Angeles. Unlike today, the world was once home to many related species or subspecies of human, and when they stumbled upon one another, mating was not out of the question. As a result, modern Europeans carry a smattering of Neanderthal genes, while indigenous Australians, Polynesians, and Melanesians carry genes from Denisovans, another group of archaic humans. Previous studies have hinted that other ancient humans once roamed Earth, but without any fossils or DNA to pour over, researchers have struggled to learn more about them." End quote. We believe these fossils, if found, and they most probably have, due to them not fitting modern paradigm, would either unfortunately be misdated or simply vanish. Regardless, we find Sharam's compelling and reinforcing research of a now lost ghost civilization highly compelling. <laughs>